Solo act? Yeah, no. Now, used to, what, work with a cat? Every time he'd play a C major, he'd puke a hairball? I used to have a partner. What happened? He threw himself off the George Washington Bridge. I don't blame him. I couldn't take it either, having to play Jimmy Crack Corn every night. Oh, pardon me for saying so. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? George Washington Bridge. You throw yourself off the Brooklyn Bridge, traditionally. George Washington Bridge. Who does that? What was he, a dumbbell? Not really. And that was a clip from Inside Lewin Davis. I'm delighted to say been joined by its writers, editors and directors. They are Joel and Ethan Cohen. Gentlemen, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are Hello. you? Hello. Very good. And for the purposes of, uh, uh, of our audience, can you identify yourselves, please? This is Ethan. And Joel. Okay, so Joel is slightly lower in... Uh, I'm going to be a lot lower. Okay, well, that's good. So inside Lewin Davis, just to, so explain, please, who Lewin Davis is and why we are indeed inside him. He's, uh, well, the main character in the movie, the title character, is a musician in Greenwich Village in 1961, kind of the uh, part of the folk revival scene in Greenwich Village at the time. Now, wh- wh- and why have you given him a Welsh name, just out of just out of, there, it's, which is discussed in the movie as to uh, as to where his name is, uh, has come from? Why, why Lewin? I'm not quite sure how you come up with names for characters. You just pluck them out of the air, and they seem right. It might be because part of the w- repertoire, you know, it's it's uh, American folk music, which descends from different sources, but a lot of them are. Scots, Irish, Welsh, you know, the extremities yes. of the British Isles. A, a, lot of, a lot of our music in the States comes from that. So it, it has been, some people have thought it might be something to do with Bob Dylan and Dylan Thomas and giving it some kind of Welsh twist that way. Is there any, maybe that was the thought I process? Don't either, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't I don't know we were so. thinking that. Although, you know, maybe in the back of your mind, not even in the back of your mind, maybe for some reason it seems right for that reason. But uh, no, we weren't consciously thinking about that. Now, why 1961? So it's very deliberately pre-Dylan, although there is this uh, sort of passing appearance from, from Bob Dylan right at the very end of the movie. But why have you set it here in 61? Well, just that. We were sort of mostly interested from the point of view of what seemed like a, uh, a, a, a fertile ground to set a movie in. Um, we were mostly interested in the period that preceded Dylan's arrival in New York for a number of reasons. I mean, but principally because um, it's a very interesting time that people know, in general, much less about than the period that Dylan you know, that 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 the scene, you know, became once Dylan arrived, the way he transformed it and what it eventually became. Um, so it's a very interesting time, but one that people know less about. Yes. Yeah, so view, viewed from here, maybe we'll, we understand the scene after Dylan, and and he obviously had a direct link to Guthrie, to, uh, to Woody Guthrie. This is like sort of the interregnum in between the two. Tell us about the music uh, that that features and uh, Lewin Davis, played by Oscar Isaac. Just what sort of what sort of music are they singing? Is it traditional? Is it sea shanties? What? Um, well, it, yes, it was. It was both of those things, and you're right. It is a sort of an interregnum between the period that you associate with Woody Guthrie and some of what Pete Seeger was doing in the uh, sure. early mid '50s. Um, but it's it is a little bit different. It's what D- Dave Van Rock actually called the great folk scare. It's the last few years of the '50s and the very early '60s. Um, college kids and 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 musicians from the boroughs. Some of them middle class kids, some of them working class kids came into the village and they started uh, they started singing music that was a revival of songs that um, were are sort of considered American roots music, whether they're blues or they're sort of Appalachian songs or songs that have sort of Celtic antecedents, as Ethan was saying, but were part of the sort of early American songbook and were being collected by folklorists. So sea shanties actually were among them. There was a there was a, a singer on the scene at that time named Paul Clayton from New Bedford, and that's principally what he sung. Um, and there was a sort of, you know, there was, a, there was a, a sort of reverence for the music and a sort of obsession with authenticity in terms of how they were presented, very sort of unadorned, straightforward. Um, the music was generally done in coffee shops or what they call basket houses, where the musicians would be paid simply by 
passing a basket around. And um, um, that was the scene. And in finding Lewin Davis, just just uh, we'll exp- find out about Oscar Isaac in just a moment. Just explain what happens to him in the movie because he's he's a good singer. He has a uh, a beautiful voice. He has got some good songs, but he's kind of all washed up. Well, it's not so much what. Well, yeah, you could say he's washed up, or he's just not getting any traction. Yeah. Um, in terms of where he's going and what his career is, and um, and yeah, it was important for us from that just that. The story be about the original conception of the story um, was that this was about a musician who was actually very talented and very good at what he did, but was not successful. Uh, and the movie wanted to sort of raise the questions why. It didn't seem like a story to us at all, or at all interesting to make a movie about a character who wasn't successful and wasn't very good. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, that didn't seem to go anywhere interesting. <laughs> yeah, so there's no story to tell. But an artist who is good and has got some good songs, who still doesn't make it. Uh, that's the issue. He has a bad week, though, doesn't he, guys? I mean, you've given him a rough old time. Yeah, he has a hell of a week. It's a, it's a bad few days. It's a bad stretch, but probably not an unrepresentative stretch of his life. Did you, in finding Oscar Isaac, did you look for actors who could sing a bit or you- singers who could act a bit? Well, we started by looking for the latter, singers who could act a bit, because we because it was a story about a musician. We knew we wanted him to be, for the reasons Joel said, good at what he did, a credible musician, somebody we wanted to actually watch performing at length in the movie. So we thought, kind of naively, oh, well, then that's got to be a musician playing the part. So we looked at a bunch of musicians who did, in in an audition situation, did indeed perform the music beautifully, but then sadly had to proceed on to auditioning a dramatic scene. And that was, you know, that was always alarming. It was always very deflating. You went, oh, my God, actors really do have something that <laughs> they can act. Um, so, we, uh, so we started looking at actors... Um, who claimed that they could sing and play, and some of whom actually could, but none of them remotely at Oscar's level. Oscar really is. Uh, we were just unbelievably lucky. Oscar was like the right person for the part, who is also a compelling, a real musician. Although he's an actor by trade, he's a musician by kind of avocation and a really accomplished one. And, and was he the obvious choice? I mean, once he auditioned for you, did you go, we have found Arlo and Davis? Or did you have to, I mean, Tipo and Burnett, uh, who you've worked again with uh, on the music guns, was it, was it his choice? I mean, that collaborative choice, what happened? Well, no, yes, it was, the answer is yes, it was pretty obvious at that point. In fact, we sent a, a um, uh, we sent a uh, tape of Oscar's uh, song to T-Bone right after we'd met Oscar and uh, T-Bone said, "Yeah, well, this guy is—he's uh, better than a lot of the studio musicians I play with." I mean, I think what he said is, "He's our Hitler." That line from the producers when they finally find the guy to play Hitler. <laughs> Lorenzo Saint Dubois. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, it, I think we knew at that point. We may have tortured Oscar a little bit by not telling him for a week or two, but um, <laughs> but it why, was pretty why, obvious. Why would you do that? Um, Just because he sure. had a miserable time in the film, never yeah. mind torturing him yeah, again. Yeah, we were preparing him for the role. <laughs> it's an actor's lot. You can't just tell him you have the part. And and within the first four minutes, we realize how important having your lead guy who can sing uh, is because we don't do clips of songs. I mean, he, you, you get full songs here. It's not right. just verse and chorus or just a couple of lines. You, he has to do the whole thing. Right. Right, he has to do the whole thing. Hey, but again, it's because you know we one of the the story is about a musician, somebody who that's what he does, and that's how he expresses himself. And we wanted to see him, uh, you know, do what he does, not sort of tease with a snippet of a song and cut away. But that's that's a large part of what the character is. And you have a fantastic ensemble uh, with, uh, and Joe Goodman uh, is back with you. And uh, an actor who can sing is Kerry Mulligan. She's got a terrific voice. Justin Timberlake, a, an actor who can, a singer who can act. I don't know. I mean, you, you've, got, you've got some good people here. Yeah, Justin's fantastic. I mean, and it was... And a good folk singer. And a good folk singer. I mean, you know, he, he's a musician, you know, and, and, and musicians are... They don't. They can go into, generally speaking, if you're especially someone like Justin, you can really go into any sort of uh, 
idiom, any sort of form of music, and, and he did, and jump in, and he you know, made a huge contribution to the soundtrack, not just in the stuff that he was singing. Um, he, he, he was there during the pre-records and the rehearsals of all of the music in the movie. Um, he actually sings a bass part in that Irish quartet that you hear there, uh, which was the one song in the movie which was not performed live. That was actually the one song that what you're looking at on screen are actors lip syncing. Everything else was performed live in the movie, including "Please, Mr. Kennedy." Just uh, just tell us about that song. Yeah, yes. even the, even that was live. The, the three voices are live. Actually, that has a lot of backing instrumentation, and just in the interest of keeping things together, that was pre-recorded. The instruments were pre-recorded, but it was um, given as playback. The instrument, the instrumental backing, was given as playback to the actors who all sang live on the set. And is that the only new song in the in the list? Is that right? It is. It's the only song that wasn't actually kind of in the repertoire at the time in 1961. Yeah. Uh, and, and the soundtrack is something to behold. Anything that T-Bone touches is, of course, something to behold and uh, and to be cherished for a long time. Is, am I right in saying, gentlemen, also that this is the last film that you that you are going to do on film? That I we don't know. It might be. It's uh, the uh, Roger Deakins. We've done a lot a number of movies with. Did not shoot this one. Bruno Del Bandal did. And uh, we did this, shot this on film. Bruno has yet to shoot a film digitally. Roger, since we worked with him, has shot several digitally. So what we'll end up doing on the next one is a bit up for grabs, but it's more and more difficult, certainly, to continue shooting on film. Because it has a, it feels like a vinyl film. Oh, good. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's what that's I think it is. Yeah. You know, I mean, it, that, that's what we were. That's a, that's a very big compliment. Thank you very much. Is T-Bone a vinyl man? I guess, yes. I, mean, I haven't met T-Bone, but I guess that he's a vinyl man. Yes, he is. Yeah, very so, much so. So do you have... He's vinyl man. Yeah. He's a vinyl man. We're beyond vinyl. We're back to mono men. <laughs> That's like a superhero we've created there. Yes, Vi- vinyl man. Vinyl man. <laughs> to give him a cape. <laughs> you, can, you, you can do that. I, I just imagine that the two of you with T-Bone would have some interesting digital analog conversations it's it's actually is an ongoing conversation in one that t-bone is especially interested in and interesting about uh, i have to say he has i think some very sort of startling and um, interesting insights about the difference between music that's recorded and played in analog and music that's recorded digitally and just what the sort of um, yeah, you know, T-Bone is not a Luddite, by the way. He's interested in technology, but he has, but he's, he's, um, he's protective of the sort of analog way of doing music and of recording music. And you know, it's all a little, it's all true and heartfelt, but it's also all a little fake. We all swear by analog, but we all process. You know, we cut on computer now, and all of the sound is handled digitally and. It, actually, T-Bone as well. Music is recorded, but the, you know it's 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 subsequently handled digitally, and it's all we're all somewhat but, sinners in that respect. That's a computer that we're cutting up. <laughs> and, are, and are you gracefully surrendering the things of analog, or are you sort of raging about it? Oh, you know, we're grumpy old men. <laughs> we're raging about it, but pre- reserving the right to actually exploit it for its efficiencies. So, if the, and if if the whole of Inside Lewin Davis is sort of pre-Dylan, we end with Dylan. But you've got a very interesting, uh, and I think it's a previously unreleased cut. Can you just explain how you got that? Oh man, that's a really beautiful piece of music. Actually, there are two separate recordings of the one song, a uh, Dylan song, one which we use in the movie, which is a live recording. But for the record album, the soundtrack album, there's a beautiful uh, unreleased studio recording of Dylan do, doing this song, Farewell. It was recorded during the times they were changing sessions. And it's just, a, you know, it's just one of those beautiful pieces of music. And you kind of wonder why Bob left it in the vault for 50 years. It's just um, Yeah, the first one, the one that's actually in the movie, he recorded on a session or a number of sessions that are, were released as the Whit- Whitmark demos it was a demo um and it's just him in in a, you know a room in a reel-to-reel tape recorder i think the second one was it done in a proper sound studio uh joel and ethan we appreciate uh, your time with us today uh, can you just give us uh, an idea of what you're working on next no oh. no okay. uh, <laughs> not, not, not coy we just don't know we'd tell you if we did joel and ethan cohen thank you very much for your time all right yeah, thank, thank you, you.